Hey everybody, welcome back to uh, Business and Life Stories with Mike and James. James is off this week. Um, he's probably climbing mountains in New Zealand somewhere. I'm not sure which peak he's on, but that's where he is. And this week I'm super excited because we have Melanie Hirshhorn with us, who does something that most of you probably didn't even think about. So Melanie, welcome. Thank you. And what do you do exactly? So I am what I have dubbed <laughs> to be a book marketing strategist. And so that means I kind of fill a gap between the publishing of the book and the publicity of the book. So I help authors, nonfiction authors, most of whom are business owners, develop an online presence so that when they do go on a big morning show and people go and look them up on Instagram, they find something really great and then they want to buy the book. And that's so powerful. How many times have you seen books on Amazon or somebody posts on LinkedIn or whatever, and it, you know, they're, they're doing the traditional thing. There's a book giveaway for a week or then there's a lower price, but, and Corollary to that, I guess, is how many how many people do you see on on social media saying they're best selling author, and you go look them up, and they have nothing. So it's true, and you know, being a bestseller, like that's a great thing, and there's a whole system behind that, and there are people who you can hire to help you with that. But you know, sometimes what happens is the people who are buying your book are not your ideal client. It's your mom and your aunt and your best friend from high school and a whole bunch of other people that wouldn't be your ideal reader. So then it can throw off the Amazon algorithm altogether because it starts targeting your book types to your mom. And she is probably oh, no. <laughs> ideal client. So for your ideal reader. So but you know having a best selling book that's fantastic. But to keep the momentum going, you need to have that that online platform you need to have all your ducks in a row working for you so that you can make the impact that you want in the world so how has this changed since the days when people would go they'd get published the publisher would then promote the book they'd send them on book tour and they you know the publisher would sort of take care of all that stuff to get the book out so what's different now so I actually heard it said once that the publisher now rolls out the red carpet two feet and says, you're on your own. <laughs> That's a great quote. It, it is. And I wish that I could take credit for it. I cannot, but I will say, I will repeat it because it is so apt. The truth is that the onus is on the, the author. The onus is on the author to get their marketing done for their book. And while, you know, a traditional publisher may do some stuff, they aren't going to do the, you know, the ground up. They're not going to help you, you know, really work on your messaging and then really make sure that your social media is attracting your ideal audience and, and all the things that, that I, well, that's my playground that I spend right. all day, every day in and probably dream about at night. <laughs> I'm just thinking of, uh, I have a number of friends that are fiction, published fiction authors right. and uh, giving away my age, but they, they're all from the era where the publisher did all that for you. What was the economic advantage for a publisher now to just only not do any of that? Um, well, the whole scene is different now because self-publishing isn't, you know, something that your aunt does. Self-publishing is what lots of people do. It's not, you know, it's not like that. They don't call it vanity publications like they did, you know, 20 years ago. Now there is, there's competition, right? There are hybrid publishers. There are, there's self publishers. Then there's traditional publishers. So the traditional publisher is going to be even more selective about who they choose to publish. And even then they still expect the marketing to mostly be done. I worked with a client not long ago. Mm -hmm. She was thrilled to get a traditional publisher to to give her an advance and, and get ready to publish her book. But they still said, so what are you doing? 
what are you doing to get your marketing in order? And that's where I came in. So this isn't really what you started out doing. I mean, anybody that goes and looks at your LinkedIn profile, there's some other things on there. How did you decide to be the uh, the book um, the book marketing expert? Well, you know, I don't think I decided it as much as it decided it for me. Um, it was decided for me. It it just it kind of. Well, I'll take you back. So yes, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, you'll see that I used to work in uh, publicity and then I got a master's in journalism and I worked as a journalist. And then when I was pregnant with my daughter, I got laid off <laughs> and I went, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. and I was like, I'm not even on your health insurance. Why are you firing? No. Um, <laughs> and so um, I, 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 then I was like, you know, I had this, this burning desire to, to be a fashion designer and the fashions I want to design are breastfeeding clothes. Mm. And I thought it's now or never. I'm, I'm very much a kind of person where I, I'm, I don't want to say I throw caution to the wind, but I certainly, if I have an idea, I, I am confident enough to know that I'm going to give it my all. And so I did. And I was designing clothes. I was selling them on Nordstrom.com and on Amazon and in, other, in boutiques in North America. And then I was at the point where I thought, all right, well, I think I need some more help with my, with my marketing. So I'm going to hire somebody to help me. And it turned out to be both a blessing and a curse. So she was emotionally and verbally abusive to me and took my money <laughs> and I basically started feeling like I was an inch tall and, mm. and I, I thought, all right, I can't, you know, I can't, I can't keep doing this anymore. I can't even open the door to my office. I'm so stressed and upset. And so eventually I closed the business. And when I was no longer doing that, I'll tell you, I still have some of them in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't get rid of everything. And when I when I thought, okay, what can I do now? I decided to to take what I had learned from marketing and, and put my years of PR and journalism and marketing my business together and go, I can help people know that they can do this too. I can empower business owners to do their marketing. If I can do it, you can do it. And you're just, I've just spent so much more time trying. And then the author thing kind of happened. People started to come to me. They're like, can you help me with my book? And I went, oh my gosh, I have been looking for this. I've been looking for a gap to fill. And holy crap, this is a big gap. And, and you know, every single day I, I talk to people who say, uh, this is exactly what I experienced when I published my book. I had the excitement and then nothing. And I have a box of books sitting in a closet or under my stairs and I don't know what to do. And I want to avoid that. I want to help people not have that box of books. I want to help them have empty boxes and want to refill. <laughs> so to help them get their message and their mission out into the world. I mean, you write a book because you have a, a calling a purpose that you you have some a desire to to make an impact and and i want to help them do that and that's really powerful i can remember the days um selling my artwork that you needed an agent to get your work on book covers because it was a very um it's a very tight-knit community of book publishers right but now you don't need that at all because self-publishing so easy so what things would you consider um telling authors to focus on just the writing i mean obviously they're going to want to get you or somebody like you to help them with the marketing because most human beings are absolutely terrible at marketing their own product or service they just that's why our company exists too i mean it's hard right like yeah. i i have helped people I have coaches that help me with my marketing because it is really hard to have that objective view of your own stuff. But I would say, you know, what do 
I guess your question is kind of what, what, what can authors, what do authors really need? What should they do while they're writing? Or should they just focus on just the writing? I think, yes, focus on the writing. Absolutely. And then before you publish, start focusing on the marketing. It doesn't have to be published for you to talk about your book because your book is a wealth of information. A well, you have you basically poured all your knowledge probably into the book, so it's leverage it, you know, mine from it, and it's it's gold. So tell people about it, and you know, one thing that I that I want people to know is that you don't have to worry about giving everything away, because there's no way you're going to give it all away. It's okay to talk about what's in your book. You know, it's not like spoiler alert, you're going to reveal the ending of what happened. That's not, you know, if it's a nonfiction book, then I would say don't do that. But I tend to work with, um, I'm sorry, a fiction book. You could spoil it. Nonfiction book, I think you're okay. It reminds me of a very wise uh, sergeant in the Army that I knew that said, I could tell you everything I know and you won't remember 20% of it. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> he was so right. That's <laughs> exactly right. So um, obviously in our business at Capital Finders, we have a lot of folks who are thinking they want to write a book about what they're doing or they want to, they want to use it as a promotional tool or give away at the end of a talk or whatever. Um, what is the... Uh, what is the value or is there still a value in having proofreaders and copy editors? Do these people still exist? Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Oh, high value. Because remember, it, it, sure. I mean, it's like you said, you know, the barrier is down. So anyone can publish. And most do, yes. <laughs> but, right. But you still want to have quality product. Your name is on it. Um, you, you don't, you know you're you are attached to this and so if somebody reads it and it's you know got riddled with spelling errors and grammatical errors and that's not gonna look good on you that's still about your marketing right that's still right you because you are the face of your brand whether you want to be or not <laughs> you are and so so yes proofreaders uh editors there you know there are different kinds of editors there's the the uh, line editor who's literally going line by line, you know, proofreading. And then there's the developmental editor who is helping you organize ideas. Mm. So someone who's working with you to get their book and give birth to this book into the world, how do you help them understand their intended audience? So as an author, as an author, I would know what I want to say, but I might not have a clear picture in my head who I'm talking to. That's right. And sometimes you have a picture in your head of who you're talking to. And then once the book is finished, you're like, actually, I'm not talking to them at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk to somebody else. <laughs> that's hilarious. And that's okay because that's about marketing, right? You can market to whomever you think it will speak to. And so it's my job to know the answer to that question. Because I'm familiar with the the demographics of a difference of each social media platform, for example. So if you were uh, you wrote a book about um, starting a, a business, I would say you really should not be hanging out on you know Instagram. If your people are business people, you're likely going to want to be spending your time on LinkedIn. And I'm also a big fan of not spreading yourself so thin that you are on every single social media platform because if you can get good, really good at one, you're gonna see a lot more benefit than if you are really bad at seven of them. Hmm, yeah, the, the uh, focus method, right? Exactly. And so publishing has certainly changed a lot. How many copies of a book does a, a typical client have to sell to turn a profit. Ooh, I love that. Okay, so because I'm not in the publishing space of the book itself, that answer, I, I wish I knew the answer. And okay. I, I will say that the people I work with, they're not necessarily looking to turn a profit. 
as much as they are looking to leverage the book for something greater. Ah, so the book, the book's going to feed the business. Okay. Yes, exactly. Yep. Get that. And so whether it's to fill programs or to speak on stages or to have a one-on-one -on -one client, that's what they do. Or like you said, when somebody's speaking at the you know at the end of a, a speaking event, and then they either sell the book or they they give it away, and then twenty people sign up for their program. Oh, I'm, I'm going to share a true story with you. Yeah, um, I actually went to this business speech this guy was giving, and you know, I heard about him. I didn't know anything about him. This local guy here in Austin, so I was listening. I thought he was really interesting. And afterward, he's giving away free copies of his book. So of course everybody wants one, right? I read it in about two days and I called him up because, you know, again, local, very simple. But I called him up. He's like, there was a room of 300 people. He's the only person that has called to ask me about something in that book. Huh. And I weird. thought, wow. <laughs> I mean, it kind of delayed my writing of my own book because I thought, my gosh, you know, if that's the return. <laughs> That doesn't sound very enticing. Well, <laughs> let me ask you this. What was his call to action at the end of his speech? Read the book. <laughs> Read the book? That's what he said? Basically, yeah. Yeah. So I didn't, say, I didn't say it was a good speech, but, you know. <laughs> and that yeah. wasn't a very effective call to action either. <laughs> no. <laughs> You know, okay, you spent an hour with me. Now go spend three hours reading my book. Yeah, no thanks. How about something simple? And that's actually, if we uh -huh. talk about lead magnets, Mike, which yeah, yeah. You, you, I have talked to you ad nauseum about this elsewhere, <laughs> and he would have been better served to, to use his book as a lead magnet and say, here's the book and something else. Mm. And you know, if you want a, a digital copy of my book, sign up for it then he has their email address and yeah i've always did. liked that one yeah so so it was and he didn't it he didn't plan well enough he didn't consult with me prior to to this event apparently i, I don't think you might have been in the space this is like almost 15 years ago so you know you yeah, were, might have you might not have been in it yet <laughs> it also didn't exist the way it does now it is so different now with you know people being able to upload their stuff on Amazon. Everything has changed and it's consistently changing. And another thing that is very trendy now is audiobooks. And I don't see that going away at all. People love to hear their books being read to them. How do you get, or how, how would an author get a good reader or a good narrator for the book? Is that is that something you help with or? Is there, that... I, I'm happy to introduce an author to, I know at least three different companies that specialize in creating audiobooks. And sometimes it's hiring an actor. I have a client who hired a voice actor through his audiobook company to read, to narrate the book. This man's voice is like butter. <laughs> you just want to hear him. Just tell me more. Tell me more. I already read the book, but I want to hear it from you. Um, yeah. So, so, and you know, sometimes authors decide they want to narrate it themselves, which is a lot of work. As a former uh, voiceover person myself, a former radio person, it's tiring, really tiring to read, like on, to be on the entire time you're reading. Well, that brings up an interesting question. When when you're reading or uh, narrating, whatever you call it for the book, mm -hmm. how are you modulating your voice? I assume you're not going in at a lo loud volume, right? You probably have the microphone set so you don't have to strain yourself. Oh yeah, I would imagine that they set the microphone for it. Now I haven't I haven't ever narrated an audiobook but I would imagine that it's in a whole studio. Although I do know somebody, um, her company, you, I'm pretty sure you can do it from Zoom. You can actually record your whole book on Zoom and then they oh, take wow. it and they do work their magic. So what mistakes do you see business owners making? Um, I'm thinking of several whose names I'm not gonna mention, <laughs> but um, they've got a great product, a great service, and they want to write a book, so they get the book written. And what are some of the classic mistakes a person makes at that point? 
I love that eye roll. Could you do that yeah. again? <laughs> that was great. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I get called out on my eye roll. Yeah. So mistakes. Well, mistakes are plentiful. Uh, the first one would be jumping right to hiring a publicist without having set up their online presence at all. Mm. Um, another mistake would be thinking that a bestseller campaign and that becoming a bestseller is going to automatically translate into book sales. Another one is thinking that, that book sales are going to make you rich. There are only like a handful of authors. What, who are they? J.K. Rowling, uh, James Patterson, Stephen King. Like those people make a boatload of money. Your book, don't focus on the money. Focus on how you can leverage it. Um, other mistakes. Let's see. Um, not actually talking about the book online or posting about it one time and expecting that that is all you need to do just once. Um, and another one, I don't have a book here. I'll just pretend this is a book because it's like my calendar here. Holding up their book and posting pictures of you holding your book like this over and over and over again. That's, uh, <laughs> that's so that's so 80s late night TV style. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, right? Yeah. It's like Vanna White. Here is my book. <laughs> yeah. She gets away with it. She can do it, but stop. Yes. So the thing that you have to remember is it's not about the book itself. It's about what's inside that counts. So remembering your mission and, and talking about, you know, tips and, and how to's and, and creating engaging, valuable content from your book online, in your emails, in your blog posts, that is how you really get people excited about your book. Because then your call to action is, oh, and it's there's even more in my book. I'd love for you to grab a copy. You know, not buy my book. Stop saying buy my book. So this seems like a, a big jump from journalism. No. Is it really, or does it just look like it is? It's not at all. I use my journalism. I wear my journalism hat every single day because I'm constantly asking questions. Um, I, you know, it's about being curious and finding out, you know, what people are doing and, and how things are landing and writing in general and video. So there is so, there's so much overlap actually because marketing is really what you put out there and what what people see of you how they get to know you and where where i had to you know as a journalist i didn't have an opinion i couldn't have an opinion i had to just take everybody's opinion and, and include it this is his opinion this is her opinion i have no opinion but when you're doing marketing you get to have an opinion but I use my I use what I learned to do it in an ethical way with integrity. So what you had said was, you know, you, you do something and then you still have the skill set. And so then I wanted to jump in with a story about my grandma. So my grandma is 97 and a half, and she is one of the smartest people I've ever known. Just, she's so good with people. And she has always said to me, everything you do goes into the pot and you never know when you're going to draw from it. And I firmly believe that every experience and every skill set you develop, it's there and it's there for a reason. And, and you might not know, but you'll pull it out in some way, in some other capacity, and it's going to serve you. Wow, I'm so glad you said that. And that, that's very powerful. Um, it, it reminds me of um, Terry Pratchett used to say, I mean, he was a writer of fiction, but he used to say that people thought his books were fantasy. Really, they were just about people he worked with with different names. <laughs> <laughs> I always, always laughed at that. <laughs> that's hilarious. That is funny. And, you know, it's like, how could how could fiction be 
be uh or rather how could reality be crazier than fiction but i guess it, it can be it's pretty wild yeah so do you have any advice for i mean obviously people running early stage companies as you well know are super busy how do you balance when you're you're married you're a mom you're running a business um i assume you sleep at some point and you know oh, I, most most people with companies this is our life so like what, what are some tips you have for folks well i sleep very well um and one thing that i have learned is that you do not have to work harder to make more money mm. sometimes taking a, a a look at all the things you do that you think you actually have to do you don't have to do them so i work between 9 a.m and 3 p.m today notwithstanding <laughs> and um and i i you know i've even taken off at the at the um advice of a coach of mine i've taken my work email off of my iphone mm. so i cannot check my phone for work emails when I wake up and I can't do it when I'm driving and I'm stopped at a red light, like I have been. And I'm just so much calmer and happier about it. Um, balance is not something that I am ever going to achieve really, probably. I mean, and I mean, but it's a whole lot better than it was in COVID when all of a sudden my kids came home and I was full-time mom and trying to run a business. At least they go back to school now. So I think that if, if you can take an inventory of your business and say, okay, if, if I didn't post on Instagram today, is the world going to end? No, it's not. And so if you can take care of yourself first and, and not make it all about, well, I gotta do this, I gotta do that, then that's gonna stand you in good stead because if you burn out, your business is not gonna, go anywhere because you're like lying in a bed going I can't do it anymore yeah we've had clients work themselves into that position then they come see us and we help them mm -hmm. and how do you help them like what do you what do you help them do where we, we essentially train them how not to run out of money how to keep their burn rate below their revenue well, that uh, is and then there's a whole lot that goes into that and yeah. that, that's that's one of them that's why i ask most guests that question is what what's your tips for kind of balancing and not burning out because yeah but what we tell them breathe take the next two days and go hiking and there's so much guilt associated get, with that. get out of town for a couple of days yeah. but mike there's so much guilt associated with that especially oh, yeah. for people who have children Yes. and dogs people who have dogs feel the same guilt that people who have children do and it's like well i want to be with my kids or my dog and but i also want to be with my business and if i if i leave my business if i walk away from my business for a day the whole world is going to end and it's not it's not going to end exactly this is where we love to help people learn to delegate like really delegate like it's not really delegation if you're still thinking about it after you handed it off that's for sure that's micromanaging <laughs> <laughs> yes uh anyway so people can get a hold of you where linkedin website uh, yeah What's i'm the everywhere. Best way? but i have a gift for your listeners if that's okay I yes what do you got so i've got a, a book marketing checklist and it kind of spells out all the things that an, an author needs to do to get their marketing in place so they don't go oh crap now what and <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's just you can grab it at vipdigital.live slash checklist all right we'll have that link down below the video for everybody Thank and should people um besides going through that checklist should they contact you on linkedin or connect with you yeah. on instagram sure. or where where are you these days there i'm there and there and there i'm everywhere you're Can everywhere you? i am probably don't friend me on facebook though at this point okay. you know i don't know if you've noticed this with facebook but people are friending people and then the first message is hey join my facebook group or hey buy this from me and i'm like oh, yeah. Can yeah. You just be friends please <laughs> 
Oh, the art of conversation is dying too rapidly. Oh, well, we have to change that. Oh, I think you've given us a master class this evening in doing exactly. All right, well, folks, I encourage everybody to reach out to Melanie on LinkedIn. Definitely go through that checklist. And almost everyone that subscribes to this show, you're all running early stage companies. You got important stuff to say, whether that's in blogs, articles, or, or a book. And we had Melanie on the show because she's the best we've seen at this so far. So pay attention. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Melanie. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Mike.